This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. A lot of uncertainty right now at the top of the AFC entering week number two, not just because of the Aaron Rodgers injury last night, but also with the big three in the Chiefs, the Bengals and the Bills all struggling and going on to lose and losses are very important in the AFC. So we're going to break down the impact of the Aaron Rodgers injury, the losses for the big three and outline where you could potentially find some value in the futures market with Ryan Williams as we get set for week two and also give my first look into the week two spreads and totals over at FanDuel Sportsbook. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a managing editor of digital media for FanDuel Research. Joined here as mentioned by Ryan Williams. You can check him out on Twitter at Ryan Alexander underscore W and Ryan exciting finish to last night's game with the Jets winning on a punt return touchdown in overtime, but Still kind of a, a somber tone heading into week two, given we're not going to get to watch one of the best quarterbacks of all time. The rest of the year, Aaron Rodgers likely done due to a potentially torn Achilles. So kind of a weird note heading into week two. How are you doing today? Yeah, I mean, what a what a way to end the week, Jim. Uh, that's just not something that I, anybody expected, let alone the the Jets themselves. Um, and then, you know, to put on the spectacle that they did uh, in the second half uh, against a divisional opponent there, one who we think is a Super Bowl contender uh, with Zach Wilson at the helm was, was pretty remarkable. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, a, a, from a – from a betting and NFL standpoint, I feel, you know, pretty somber about my Jets futures, my Rodgers futures. Um, you look at just how stacked up that defense is that they've been working to build for a long time. And you just think about what if, and I'm sure, you know, nobody thinks about that more than the Jets organization there. But uh, we will see. Uh, we will see what happens. We will see if they make some calls to bring in another veteran uh, to keep the things going because uh, Zach Wilson, now granted, he probably wasn't prepared for that moment. Um, but, you know, this kind of just goes to the reason why they brought Rodgers in in the first place. Uh, so they have a lot, they have a lot to unpack going into week two. Yeah. Zach Wilson is one thing, you know, I, it's, it's a situation where you don't really want to pile on, uh, to a guy who's had a, a really rough go of it for sure, but also like it's Zach Wilson with Nathaniel Hackett and trust level with that offensive infrastructure might not be super high. No Corey Davis due to his retirement offensive line. I thought looked really good run blocking, but didn't, you know, hold up the best against the pass. And you don't really want to put Zach Wilson in situations like that. So it's a tough situation for the Jets. We're going to break down uh, the impact of the Rodgers injury in the futures market, talk about struggles of the Bills, Chiefs, and Bengals in a bit, and uh, get you ready for week two by taking my first look at the lines here in just one second. But first, a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. You can also find Covering the Spread on the FanDuel YouTube page and on FanDuel TV+. Plus. If you want to watch FanDuel TV+, Plus, to watch Up and Adams Live with Kay Adams or watch Covering the Spread, the solo shot with Tom Vecchio right now, or the Heat Check Fantasy Podcast for the NFL on Mondays and Thursdays. Go to FanDuel.com slash watch, and you can also uh, check it out on your Amazon Fire, Apple TV, or Roku devices as well. Now, Ryan, let's dig in here to the ripple effects of the Aaron Rodgers injury first, because obviously that impacts not just the Jets' futures, but... Also, it could be a situation where maybe it opens up uh, value in the AFC East for maybe the Bills, even after their loss last night, or the Dolphins, or situations like that. So there are a lot of ways we could see ripple effects from this Aaron Rodgers injury. When you look at the futures market right now, what do you think is the biggest opening as a result of the situation? Well, you're, you're probably looking at the division first and foremost. I mean, we saw the Jets, you know, kind of be just under uh, two to one to to wind out uh, in that AFC East. And now it's a two headed monster um, with the Miami Dolphins now leading the favorite uh, at plus 140 on the FanDuel Sportsbook. And then you have the Buffalo Bills not far after them uh, with the Jets coming in at just under six to one to win. I mean, that's that's really the name of the game. Like, I don't really think outside of that, Jim, it changes up too much 
on the AFC top because we'll we'll get into it later. But like the Jets were not expected to be, you know, in the top three. We have other juggernauts that are there in the in the AFC. So I think from an outlook perspective, you know, as un, as unfortunate as that is, you know, might be to some betters, it really doesn't change the scope at the top all too much. It kind of just makes you feel like, man, if you had that Jets ticket, you know, with them, you know, having the fourth or fifth best odds, depending on where you got it, like what what really could have been there uh, to pay off at the end of the season. Yeah, I think the Dolphins one is kind of the most important thing for me that I I haven't acted on yet and probably won't just because plus 140 is not like an outrageous number. And it's not as if there's zero chance the Jets or the Patriots sneak in there. But, you know, um, the, the Dolphins did get a pretty decent boost in my model after week number one, given the way they played there. I still have faith in this defense, despite the fact that uh, they did let up a decent number of points and some big long runs to the Chargers and Justin Herbert. So I, I think the Dolphins are at least interesting, but I still like the Bills. Um, I, spoiler alert, might be betting against them once again this week for the second week in a row and might be on <laughs> Dolphins money line myself at some point against the Patriots. But I, I don't think there's enough value there, a plus 140 to dive in on the Dolphins right now. But that would be the first, that was the first place I looked, honestly, when I was pulling up the futures market today was to see, okay, where do the Dolphins settle in? And it wasn't enticing enough to get me to actually pull the trigger there. Now, you talked about how the bigger impact here is what we saw elsewhere in week one because the Bills lost that game. I know we're talking about um, Aaron Rodgers and how it was kind of like a loss for the Jets, but the Bills actually got a loss in the loss column in that game. We also saw the same thing with the Chiefs and the Bengals. And uh, those are the f- top three teams in my power rankings entering this year. So right. I had high expectations. So did the market. So I want to ask you, Ryan, when you look at those three teams specifically, do you have any longer term concerns with them or was it just a one week blip we can write off? I I do have some concerns with with the Bills um, and only because of just the way that they played offense against this stout defense. So, again, you know, I think we probably have like three to four defenses that are in the realm of like what the jets were actually putting out there. You know, when you're talking about the jets and the Cowboys and the 49ers, and there's probably some other defense that I'm not thinking about. Um, So I don't feel like it's going to necessarily haunt them all year. But Jim, when we talk about this Buffalo team and the expectations, you know, and everybody was pretty low on them. So now you have an uphill battle to kind of, make yourself seem like you are at the upper echelon tier. And I think, you know, there is going to have to be some digging um, within to Josh Allen as prolific and as amazing and electrifying as he is the turnovers for him, you know, since 2018, having nearly 85 turnovers, you know, in the course of five years is, is really, you know, that says a lot. It, 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 It is a big indictment. And so, when we're looking at this division, you know, I think they they have to show me that they can, you know, make some, make some noise in this division, um, especially, you know, with that loss. It was on the road. So, you know, you're going to have to face the Jets again at home. We'll see if they can handle uh, business this week when they take on the Raiders at home. Like that has to be a shellacking uh, for me to feel good about this team, because you are looking at if you look at the FanDuel Sportsbook right now, like you are getting them 10 to 1 to win the Super Bowl, which is probably like one of the best. You know, some of the best odds that we've gotten early on in the season in Buffalo over the past two to three years. So I think you, you know, if you say you still believe in this team, take a shot on them because you do believe in the talent. You do believe that the defense is going to be able to, you know, dig deep. You do believe that, you know, guys outside of Stefan Diggs, that Dalton Kincaid is getting going. That looks like a great rookie pick for them on offense. Uh, Gabe Davis, hopefully he gets going. James Cook was looking good. As we talked about yesterday. So um, I think for for me right now, it is probably decent value, but I do worry about them as opposed to the Chiefs and the Bengals um, as, as really being a little bit far behind. Yeah, I think with the Chiefs, it's pretty easy to write that one off because they didn't have Travis Kelsey, who sounds like maybe back this week. And then also Chris Jones, who did sign a one year deal to rejoin the team for this right. week. So they were actually missing players, whereas the Bengals and the Bills really were not. The Bengals won. I, I guess like it's hard for me to get super concerned there because when 
T Higgins goes over eight on targets. Like that seems a little bit fluky playing in the rain there. Stuff like that against a very good defense. Yep. The bills. It's kind of like you said, where they leaned into the narrative, the narrative and not in a good way. The narrative around the bills was yep. if they were to struggle, it'd be because of Josh Allen turnovers because of the offensive line being a bit leaky in a couple of key spots. And that's kind of what we saw play out in that game. And then also the rush defense, um, could be an issue as well, given the number of explosive plays we saw from Brees Hall. So I agree with you where the Bills are the most concerning there of, of those big three. I'm not going to overreact on any of them personally as far as like bumping them down, but I do think it introduces more uncertainty where teams like, I, I guess probably the Dolphins, but maybe you look towards the Jaguars, the Ravens, the Browns, some team like that as being able to sneak in and, and enter that top tier. But for now to me, it really is still those three as being the top three teams in the AFC. Let's talk about some power rankings, Ryan, and talk about teams that impressed you the most in week number one. And when you're looking at the way you view the hierarchy of the league, which teams got the biggest boost for you based on what they did in week number one? The AFC is absolutely outrageous, Jim. Like it, it really, I feel like we talk about this year after year after year, but it, it's kind of getting absurd because the t- two of the biggest teams that surprised me are like not the three teams that we mentioned. You know, right. I think Jacksonville can make some noise with that offense and what they've built around Trevor Lawrence there. You're looking at them 19 to one to win the Super Bowl. I know a lot of people were talking about uh, talking up. Uh, Trevor Lawrence to uh, potentially be the MVP of the league. And you're looking at his odds now uh, coming in at where did I just, yeah, nine to one. He's the third highest now um, in the market, which is absolutely incredible. We can stay there um, in the MVP market and look at Tua. Tua is all of a sudden now the front runner at six to one. Um, And that's just how, you know, that's just how prolific, you know, I think we think about things the way that the season started last year before Tua got hurt. Like this offense was firing on all cylinders. They have a top three offensive unit. That's that's not even, I don't think, debatable at this point and what we've seen over the past two years when this unit is full, fully healthy. And so you're looking at the Miami Dolphins now 17 to one uh, to be able to hoist the Lombardi at the end of the year. Like these two teams are really, you know, I think I'm really going to be paying attention um, to these two teams, especially like we talk about defensive units. I wouldn't put them at top four yet, but like they were playing without Jalen Ramsey last week. Jalen Ramsey comes back like he can help out in that division against Buffalo. You know, I don't the Jets and the Patriots like the Miami Miami could be right there. Um, And so we see that reflected in the market, of course, already. Um, But those are the two teams that that really stuck out and surprised me. Um, And I do have, you know, I think the in the NFC, we talked about this before um, in the summer, really runs through Philly and San Fran. That's reflected in the odds. Like, I don't think there's, you know, any way shape around that. But and I don't want to I don't want to jump ahead of the gun, Jim, if this is doing so. But I do think the Minnesota Vikings like are poised to be able to take control of their own destiny. Like they are not, it's not reflective in the market on how wide open the NFC North is. And I think that's where, you know, we need to take advantage right now. You're looking at them plus 410 to win the NFC North. Like their odds to win the Super Bowl are absolutely outrageous. Their odds to win the AFC are, are pretty outrageous in and of itself. And so you're thinking about, okay, like, this team wins the division, like they get into the playoffs, anything can kind of happen. We saw their offense look pretty good. You know, I think they just had a couple things to figure out, but they can get Madison going. Jordan Addison looked incredible uh, in his first game. Uh, And we all know what Justin Jefferson can do in the TJ Hawkinson, you know, addition. I really think that they're going to be able to make some noise. And I don't think, you know, we still don't know if the Lions are as good as they are. And the Packers probably played one of the worst teams uh, in the league. So um, I think that there's still left to be unpacked with this Minnesota team. And as always, like it goes through Kirk Cousins. But I think for them right now, they're probably one of my favorite teams to kind of get some futures on. Yeah, potentially buying low in Minnesota. They are 20 or 19 to 1 to win the NFC. And to win the NFC North, uh, their are, odds are currently plus 410. Now, I actually, if we're talking about teams that I bumped up a lot in week one, I actually do give the Packers a lot of credit for that win over the Bears. So if I'm talking about teams that I boost the yeah. most based on week one, I actually think I'd pick the Packers there. And 
you know, I, I understand what you said about like the, the the Bears defense being what it is. And that's very true. But I think to me, the reason I was impressed with that victory is because it came via Jordan Love playing very well without Christian Watson. And when I talk about like my internal expectations and I want to see teams exceed them, when you exceed expectations without a difference making player on your offense, that to me is a situation where it gets my attention is what I would say with the Green Bay Packers. And that's kind of what happened with them in that game. Now, like you said, we don't want to overreact because the Bears definitely struggle and did not play their best in that game. But Aaron Jones looked phenomenal. We know what he can do. We know that that uh, punch of him and A.J. Dillon, that offensive line, gave Jordan Love. Maybe it's because of the Bears' defensive line, but they kept Mm -hmm. Jordan Love in a calm pocket. And I don't want like, kind of like Zach Wilson, I don't want to see Jordan love in chaos. And if you can keep him out of chaos for a longer time, I think that that is, that's a situation where we can potentially see things go pretty well for green Bay. So I actually think that the Packers deserve a pretty big boost. And I'm not taking conference futures on them, not looking at the Super Bowl market, not going to bother there. And I also don't think I want them at plus 290 because I do respect the Lions a lot and think the Lions are in a good position this week too against the Seahawks with their offensive line being banged up. But I do think that Green Bay deserves a bit of attention for what they did despite their opponent week one. No, definitely. And I think that the defense has been the biggest thing for them. Uh, You know, I guess, you know, one of those things uh, because they've had a good talented unit. They just haven't been able to stay healthy. Um, across you know Aaron Rodgers' last term there and so if they can you know be reflective of what they showed us on Sunday afternoon that's pretty scary thinking that the Packers get Christian Watson back and what deep threat he can be um, and getting those guys in the backfield going yeah for sure and the defense is is a key part of this as well and I was not the biggest Jordan Love guy coming out, so I'm still somewhat skeptical there in that regard, but I think the infrastructure around him is pretty good, as we saw in that game. Let's start with the flip side here. Maybe we already discussed uh, one of your biggest fallers uh, and talking about the Chiefs, Bengals, and Bills, but Ryan, which teams to you got the biggest downgrade based on what we saw in the opener this year? Yeah, I think the Steelers are ones that we (laughs) have to just talk about. Um, You know, I think people... I was one of the people thinking they have a chance to finish better than the Browns, you know, in their own division. I didn't think that they were as good um, as the Ravens and the Bengals fully healthy, but we've seen three teams. We've seen uh, a division send three teams to the playoffs before. So you thought, man, if Kenny Pickett can kind of take that extra step in the way that this defense kind of played, um, you like to look at that. Yeah, I see you pull up the regular season odds there, you know, with their over eight and a half wins now being at plus 100. And I, don't, I really don't know uh, how we can really feel confident about that. We have to see a little bit more from Kenny Pickett. And now, you know, I know that we, it's week one. Like we try not to overreact on just, you just bring up the facts and there's definitely no overreaction to like to Buffalo or Pittsburgh, what have you, so to speak just yet. But, but the trend continues the way that it does. And what we saw there in a home game against one of the better teams in, in the, in the NFL, like, the, you know, that you can't really sneeze at that. They were, it's not like they were out there and doing this against the Cardinals. Like, um, they were, uh, you know, getting getting tested. And I think that that's going to, you know, show something. But as it stands right now, you know, the way that we were feeling about this team preseason, I just have to believe that um, I have to downgrade them a little bit there. I think so, too. I think that's a, a very fair one to bring up because it, I know – I know, like you said, it's the the 49ers. They're a buzzsaw. I agree with that. I agree with what you said, but I also agree with what you said in the fact that like you can't get blown out. Like the degree to which you lose when you're facing good teams matters as well. So I feel like if we're talking about teams where our expectations shifted most, I still think this defense would be very good. Um, You know, a a defense with TJ Watt, Minka Fitzpatrick, and Mike Tomlin is going to be good, but offense is rough Deontay Johnson is banged up I not the biggest Deontay Johnson fan but when it it changes your offense to be Deontay Johnson George Pickens to being George Pickens Allen Robinson Calvin Austin that's not ideal especially for an offensive line that I'm not super high on so we were both in the Steelers week one didn't go great for either of us um and I think (laughs) that um maybe we're just burned by this one team but I I agree with you where it's okay to be 
a little bit annoyed with them after what we saw here. Now, Ryan, yeah. you mentioned the Vikings wanted to buy in on their conference futures, taking a look at them to win the NFC North, buying low on them. Any other futures you're looking at entering week number two? Yeah, uh, the the Vikings have been one uh, that I've been looking at really early. Uh, I will say, and I, I haven't really settled on this, but I think, you know, we can really get some favorable stuff happening in the offensive player of the year market right now. Um, just because of how, you know, again, overreaction uh, Sunday, Monday. Um, Tyreek Hill is all the way up at just under nine to one uh, to win this award. Justin Jefferson at 12 to one. And so is Christian McCaffrey. And then we look at Jamar Chase and it starts to get to like 27 to one. And there's just so many, you know, offensive players who are stout here that, you know, could really make some noise. I'm looking at like maybe Amon Ross St. Brown, the way he's kind of, they've been showcasing him in the offense over the past couple seasons. Like I think a guy like Lamar at 36 to one is interesting. Now with JK Dobbins being out, like does mm-hmm. Lamar go back to just having to do it all. And we no, talked about Todd Munkin coming in and the air raid offense could be showing itself. And maybe that is the case, but if he's the running back as well too, does that carry some weight? And then, you know, we start to go down at some of these other players and like even a Cal- Calvin Ridley, at 65 to one, if you believe in Jacksonville, you know, and, and, and I'm saying all of these long shots, Jim, but just to kind of get people thinking about it, like if you do not think at the end of the year, it's going to be Tyreek Hill, Justin Jefferson or Christian McCaffrey, just take some shots on some of these guys, because the prices on some of these are only going to start to dwindle down as we get more games and get more real estate to them. So I think that's a really fun market um, to really get some futures on right now, especially with people and as we're talking like, right, we think we know who these teams are and then we come to find out, oh yeah, no, it's it, the Bengals are still the Bengals and, you know, Jamar Chase is going to be amazing and, you know, we can get futures on, on that to pay off. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the Ridley one is the one that caught my attention there because he's 65 to one for off- offensive player of the year, 30 to one to lead the league in receiving yards. Is it at a deficit because Tyreek Hill had 16,000 receiving yards in week one? Justin Jefferson <laughs> had 15,000 receiving yards, but right. got a lot of work. He's got an efficient yeah. quarterback. They're going to play, you know, the Titans defense is tough, but like not the toughest schedule uh, in the AFC South. Ridley at 30 to one. That's not totally totally out of uh, consideration at least for me there uh so i think yeah. that being on ridley is at least you got my attention there ryan well in some of these you know i think what we have to remember is just think about this if these were preseason odds you know i think yeah. we're getting a lot of real estate coming in just from one week of games and right. you, we see what can happen you know with the jk dobbins and the aaron Rodgers, and not that we wish that at all but like injuries do happen in this league yeah. and so you know these are not foregone conclusions we're not talking about this being week 13 or 14 and we have so much to go off of we only have one week and so i think taking advantage of these future markets like that to be able to take some long shots as if this were the preseason is is just as fun to do after week one if not more um because you can see uh you can see that payoff yeah, absolutely. Especially on guys who actually did play well in week one, like Ridley, uh, like Amon yeah. Ross A. Brown, 30 to one as well. I think that having guys like, it's not like they're, they were duds. Uh, we're not totally buying low, right? Like we're still buying the guys with good usage. Right. Just happen to get them at potentially better odds than we were before. That is Ryan Williams. Make sure you check him out on Twitter at Ryan Alexander underscore W. Ryan, we'll be back with you once again next week on Monday to preview Monday to football. Actually, a couple of games next week on Monday. So That's be a right. little two-game slate then. Looking forward to it and have a good week until then. You too, Jim. Best of luck. Talk later. All righty, again, make sure you find Ryan on Twitter at Ryan Alexander underscore W uh, to get all of his work over there. Check him out right here on the on Covering the Spread every Monday and Tuesday as well. We're going to take uh, a look at the week two lines, talking about some spreads, money lines, and totals that my model likes here in just one second. But first, get ready for the NFL season with incredible offers from FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers can bet $5 and get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Plus, all customers who bet $5 will get $100 off NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Now is the best time to join FanDuel. The app is easy to use, and you can bet on everything from spreads to player props and more. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL, must be 21 plus and president in select states. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino, LLC. 
First online real money wager only. $10 first deposit required. Bonus issued as non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit fanduel.com slash RG in Colorado, Iowa, Michigan, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Tennessee, and Virginia. Call 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 53342 in... I lost my spot. Arizona. There we go. 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat in Connecticut. 1-800-9 with it in Indiana. 1-800-522-4700 visit ksgamblinghealth.com in Kansas. 1-877-770-STOP in Louisiana. Visit mdgamblinghealth.org in Maryland. 1-800-GAMBLER.net in West Virginia or call 1-800-522-4700 in Wyoming. Hope is here. Visit gamblinghelplinema.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support in Massachusetts. Call 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY in New York. NFL Sunday ticket offer ends 9-18-23. No refunds. Terms and embargoes apply. $100 off NFL Sunday ticket, not YouTube TV. YouTube TV base plan required to watch YouTube TV. Redemption requires a Google account and current form of payment. Commercial use is excluded. Let's take a look now at the week two betting odds over at FanDuel Sportsbook and try to identify some spots where my model is showing value for week number two. And the first one is actually in the team that I was on in week number one as well. That's the Los Angeles Rams. Now, the scary thing is they're facing the San Francisco 49ers, who we just talked about put a butt whipping on the Steelers in week one. But we're getting eight points on the Rams at minus 110 at home. And I feel like that number is a bit too steep. Uh, I think the key thing here for me when looking at this game and also analyzing that Rams week one game is not the final score, but the fact that Matthew Stafford looked healthy. And when you look at the futures market for the Rams and look at win totals and stuff like that, it's baking in the possibility that guys like Matthew Stafford, like Aaron Donald, wind up getting hurt and miss time. And that's kind of factored in. And I feel like a lot of the downward trajectory or the downward movement in those futures is playing into the the number here. Whereas we know Stafford and Donald will be healthy going into this game. Cooper Cup will not, but like, those two guys will be here. So even after downgrading for uh, Cooper Cup, I still feel like the Rams should probably be a bit closer in this game. The defense stepped up, I would say. Uh, part of it may have been because C the Seattle offensive line lost both of its tackles during the game. Maybe it was just that. But And it's also possible the 49ers are just unstoppable right now. But we're getting eight points on a team that is at home with a healthy quarterback and a healthy Aaron Donald. That, to me, says we should probably be willing to take the eight at minus 110 and bet on the Rams here. So Rams were good to me last week. I want to be on them once again for this week just because it's a lot of points for a team at home. Maybe I just cross off teams facing the 49ers after week two, but at least for right now, I do think there is good value in taking the Rams at plus eight. Second one is going to be the Houston Texans taking on the Indianapolis Colts. The Texans money line is plus one of six at FanDuel Sportsbook and Texans are at home in this game. And I do feel like they should be slight favorites here. My model makes them slight favorites. Colts offense, I would say looked a bit more functional in week one, but that's before we consider the context where the Colts were at home indoors facing the Jaguars while the Texans were on the road facing the Baltimore Ravens. Now they're back at home here. I'd assume the defense for the Texans will be without Jalen Petrie because he had to stay overnight at the hospital with a lung issue and Petrie played well last year. So that is a blow to their defense, but the defense overall, I thought played pretty well in that game after you, you know, consider the circumstances uh, facing that Baltimore Ravens offense, the Colts ground attack looked pretty bad without Jonathan Taylor. Uh, Deion Jackson was superbly inefficient. Evan Hall is now banged up. And Zach Moss, if he's able to go, is not some massive difference maker, right? at least not to me, for this offense. So I feel like these two teams are a bit more evenly matched than what this number is saying. And when you give the Texans the bump for being at home, I think that taking the plus money on the money line is the right approach here. So to me, the Texans money line plus 106, I show value there. I agree with what the model is saying, and I do want to take that as being my first money line of the week. Final spread or money line for me in week number two is going to be the Raiders taking on the Buffalo Bills. 
I, this number is down from nine and a half prior to last night's game. And this is not a reaction to what we saw from the Bills. Uh, I think it's kind of more of a reaction, at least for me, to what we saw from the Raiders. Uh, the plus eight and a half is minus 105. And I'm going to assume Jacoby Myers and Chandler Smith or Chandler Jones uh, don't play in this game. Jones upset with the, the coaching staff in the front office. So he probably is not going to go. Myers had a really scary hit on Sunday. So I'm just going to assume that he's not going to go. But I'd still project the Raiders to be a decently efficient passing offense with Jimmy Garoppolo because Garoppolo throughout his career has been an efficient passer despite his downsides. He still got Devontae Adams there as well, and that is worth plenty. Now, the Bills will not play as poorly as they did on Monday night. Um, that's not what you would expect for this team as they get more familiar with um, having Dalton Kincaid in that offense. They get more comfortable with things. But like, again, like we said with Ryan, a lot of the issues that they had were issues we thought they might have coming into this year. Josh Allen, occasional turnovers, the brain farts that he can have, stuff like that. And then also the offensive line having a couple leaky spots. So to me, it's a combination. The Raiders playing very well in week number one against a good Broncos defense on the road, combined with the fact that Bra the, the Bills kind of leaned into some of the issues that, that we thought they might have coming into this year. I've got the Bills as 6.2 point favorites, so still pretty heavily favored in this game. But uh, again, the spread is eight and a half at minus 105. We get across seven here. I think that's enough where I do want to take the Raiders plus eight and a half at minus 105. Again, not downgrading the Bills necessarily entirely here, but just respecting the Raiders and how well they played in week number one. Final bet for me this week is going to be a total that is going to be in the uh, Patriots versus Dolphins game on Sunday night football. And as you know, I was on an under for a Dolphins game last week. That did not go well as the Dolphins and Chargers threatened to hit the total by themselves, respectively. Total for this game is 47 and a half and minus 112. And I'm going to go back to the under here and we'll see how that goes. And part of it is because it is above a key number of 47. A couple different combinations get you to 47, a 27-20 game, a 24-23 game, stuff like that. So there are a lot of combinations that get you to 47. We get the we get that as a hit here on under 47 and a half at minus 112. Now that Chargers Dolphins game was phenomenal. But it was played indoors. Uh, this one is outside. Current wind projections of five miles per hour. So nothing too scary there, but it is a bit of a downgrade. Now, SoFi does let in wind, uh, which is worth noting. So it's an indoor game, but can be some wind there. New England's offense, fine against the Eagles, especially in the second half. But I wouldn't say they did anything to dramatically alter my expectations of them. And I also think that looking at this matchup here on the opposing side, where the Dolphins offense has the ball, I have more faith in Bill Belichick to cook up a defensive scheme that can prevent a shootout, prevent Tyree Kill from going for, again, 16,000 yards, than I have faith in Brandon Staley. And that plays a role here as well. So to me, it's kind of just too high of a number for a game that involves two defenses I respect. I know the Dolphins let up a lot of points in week one, but I respect their defense. Patriots played well. I, I thought they played really well against the Eagles, which is kind of what you expect. So to me, the under here at 47 and a half is the right way to go. Now, again, similar to betting against the Niners, maybe I just abandon this approach and stop betting unders on Dolphins games after week two. Again, depending on the number, obviously, but I think for right now, taking the under on 47 and a half is the right way to go. So bets for this week that I like as of right now, Dolphins, Patriots under 47 and a half at minus 112. The Raiders plus eight at eight and a half at minus 105. Texans money line at plus 106 and the Rams plus eight, which is minus 110 against the San Francisco 49ers. Final thing for today is we got to go back through last week's recommendations here on the show, beginning with college football. We had Dr. Ed Fang on to talk college football at the NFL last week. You can find Ed on Twitter at the Power Rank and check him out at thepowerrank.com. On the college side of things, Ed had Nebraska plus two and a half against Colorado, and it held there the entire week. And I understand why Ed was here. And I think if it had gotten to like three and a half, I probably would have joined him on this. But Colorado just sick once again. Did it with a huge win here. One of the best stories in, in the nation right now. Really fun to watch them go. Uh, so bummer to not get that win there. But it is fun to have a talking point like Colorado so present in our lives right now. 
In the NFL, Ed, Ed had a couple of bets. He liked Kansas City minus four and a half against the Lions. We were talking about uh, before Travis Kelsey was officially ruled out, but it did seem pretty likely that he would be. Obviously, the Lions won by one, and uh, there was a pick six in the mix there, but um, no win there. Other one was Bengals minus two and a half. A lot of line movement towards the Browns, especially on Sunday morning, where I think the Browns' money line closed at around minus 108 or so, and the Browns did win that one outright. So a tough week there. We'll have Ed back on on Wednesday to talk, talk college football week number three, and then on Thursday to talk NFL week number two. We had JJ Zach Reason on to talk some player props. You can find JJ on Twitter at late round QB and check out his work at late round.com and find the late round fantasy football podcast. JJ got a nice hit with tank Bigsby for an anytime touchdown at plus three ten. Bigsby nearly scored on a longer run and Kind of bummed because I thought he might get in there, but the Jags, their credit did let him bang it home later on. So plus 310, a good hit there for JG on Bigsby. Tough miss on James Conner. He had under 59 and a half rushing yards and minus 114. And the Cardinals kept that game close, but Conner was still at 59 rushing yards very late in that game. Did get uh, a rush attempt to go over 59 and a half pretty late, finished 62. So Almost a miss, almost a hit there, but uh, couldn't quite get it. JJ had Khalil Herbert over 49 and a half rushing yards at minus 114 for the Bears. Bears got down big. Herbert finished with 27 yards, leading on Roshan Johnson late in that game to close things out. So, uh, game script got a ride there. The other anytime touchdown that was Jahan Dotson at plus 235. Dotson had seven targets uh, in a situation where the, the commanders did get a win, but no touchdown there for Dotson. Final one was a same game parlay, which missed by one leg. He had DK Metcalf over 60 and a half receiving yards, Cam Akers under 62 and a half rushing yards, and Metcalf for an anytime touchdown at, uh, I don't recall the odds on that specifically, but the full odds for the same game parlay was plus 531. Got the touchdown. Akers went way under that number, but Metcalf. Finished with 47 yards, so couldn't quite get to 60 and a half there. So tough one, but uh, JJ did give it a good run with the SGP. Again, find him on Twitter at late round QB. We had Ryan on last night to talk Monday Night Football. He liked the Jets plus two and a half as he won traditional market bet. Also did have uh, the total under 45 and a half. Both those did hit. The Jets uh, plus two and a half hitting in the most wild fashion possible and the uh, the under hitting, despite the fact it went to OT and there was a return touchdown that game. So good call by Ryan on both those there. Also had Alan Lazard over 38 and a half receiving yards and the under, uh, or sorry, Lazard over 38 and a half receiving yards. That one hits a Lazard, I think 46 receiving yards on two receptions. So good call by Ryan there. The two that didn't hit were the anytime touchdowns. Josh Allen plus 160, Dawson Knox plus 350, but very profitable night for Ryan. So good calls by him across the board. Uh, again, check him out on Twitter at Ryan Alexander underscore W. I also had the Jets money line against the Bills. It moved against me because we talked about this, I believe, like two Mondays before week one. I got it at plus 106, and I think it settled in around plus 110 or so. Um, so I didn't get good closing line value there, but the Jets defense is legit and played a big factor in that win last night for them. I had the under on Chargers Dolphins, as mentioned. We know how that one went. Um, did not go well. Ryan and I both had the Steelers plus of points. I got it at plus three, and Ryan had it at a plus two and a five, two and a half. So that didn't go well either. I did get a win with the Rams, though. They were plus five and a half when we talked about it. It closed at four and a half, and they won outright, which was nice. So two and two week for me with the Jets money line and the Rams plus five and a half being the two wins, two losses, Chargers, Dolphins under, and uh, the Steelers plus three. So depending on how you scale those, about a break even week uh, for me with NFL stuff. On the NASCAR side of things, had a good week. I had three bets that I liked on Friday when we talked. Those were Ryan Blaney, a plus 2,200 to win. Eric Jones, plus 550 for a top 10. And Austin Sendrick, 8-1 to one for a top 10. And Blaney and Sendrick did not hit, but Jones nearly won the freaking race. He was running top five the entire race. And late pit stop, he takes two tires with two laps left. And Jones was battling for the lead at the white flag with Joey Logano. But Tyler Reddick was on fresher tires, passing for the win. But hey. Jones podium. He finished third in that game. I didn't get the podium odds, uh, but did hit the top 10 at plus 550. So awesome to see Jones pull through on that. Hopefully that partially makes up for was not, not a banner week for the podcast, but 
I think that the process across the board was pretty good. So we'll see how things go in week number two. And happy to have the hit on Tank Bigsby and Eric Jones uh, to hopefully level things out a bit for you there. That's all we got here for today on covering the spread. Got to get, got to big, give a big thank you once again to Ryan Williams. Check him out on Twitter at Ryan Alexander underscore W. We'll get him back here on the show on Monday to preview those two Monday night football games. As for us, we are back here once again, Wednesday talking to Dr. Ed Feng about week three across college football, probably more Colorado talk coming up there and previewing this week's biggest games. You can find that by subscribing to covering the spread wherever you get your podcast. Also find us on the FanDuel YouTube page and FanDuel TV+. Plus. If you've got any questions for me, I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow FanDuel Research at FanDuel Research. Want to thank you all for tuning in for today. Good luck to you with your bets, whatever they may be, across the next couple of days. We'll talk to you once again tomorrow to talk some college football. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 